A warm welcome. You're watching Lie Eye on Africa, rather. I'm Rochelle Ferguson Bure with the top stories for you on the continent. Collective and individual reparations in the first such ruling, the ICC orders ex-Congolese warlord German Katanga to pay symbolic damages to victims of a 2003 militia attack. The largest coordinated vaccination campaign against polio Africa has ever seen. Health workers in 13 countries prepare to go door to door to immunise more than 116 million children. And a glimpse of the continent's vibrant fashion scene, the Cape Town Fashion Festival kicks off with a chance for designers to showcase their latest creations on the catwalk. But first, to the Central African Republic, where there are reports that at least uh, dozens of people have been killed and many more injured since Tuesday when armed men attacked three villages in the central Bomberi region. Well, a short time ago, I spoke to uh, Vladimir Montiero, the spokesperson for the UN mission in the Central African Republic. Here's what he told me. Two uh, attacks occurred, one in uh, Bakumai, south of Bria, in the east part of Central Africa. We deployed, we, uh, the UN mission, deployed a patrol uh, for more information, but couldn't uh, reach out the place because the bridge was destroyed by um, the armed group. These are combats between ex LKs FPRC, and UPC. And uh, FPRC is joined by anti Balaka. The other incident occurred in three uh, localities not far from Bambari. Uh, uh, we don't have any any details about uh, the, those who were killed. In a landmark decision, the International Criminal Court has ordered ex-Congolese warlord Germain Katanga to pay damages to victims of a brutal attack on their village in 2003. Well, the judge estimated the total damage caused in the attack at $3.7 million, but ruled Katanga, who's currently serving a 12-year sentence, should pay a symbolic sum of $250 to each victim, plus a further $1 million in collective reparations. Well, for more on this story, Fernand Van Tetz is in the Netherlands. Court for the first time ever had to decide how much reparations to pay. They've never done this before. And so they had to do things like estimate the cost of a house in the village of Bogoro where this attack took place in 2003. They put that at around $600. They awarded around $500 for things like a herd of cattle, but also much, much trickier questions like how much to award for the loss of, of, of a close family member. That the court has now put at $8,000. Uh, and then they've awarded this in a, in a two-structured way. So they've awarded it in two tiers. One is this individual sum of $250 per person. Uh, that is 297 people will be awarded that sum out of 341 people who put forward a case. There's a thousand page uh, document outlaying who is eligible for that and why. Uh, and then the vast sum, I mean, that's only about 6% of that 1 million sum. The majority will go to collective uh, things for the community. So that's support for housing, support for education. The school is destroyed, for example. But also support for psychological support, really, just to deal with what happened back then. Uh, now, Mr. Katinga himself, he watched this from jail in Kinshasa. He does not have money, but there's a trust fund for victims under the ICC. They've been invited to contribute to make sure that some of that money does arrive at the people that have been waiting for so long. The Democratic Republic of Congo is still trying to steer its way through a political crisis towards presidential elections. Last December, DRC's governing coalition and the opposition signed a political agreement, but its implementation has so far stalled. Well, that stalling has happened particularly over the naming of a prime minister. Earlier, Congo's Minister of Communications, Lambert Mende, told France 24 that despite obstacles, some progress has been made. It is the implementation of the agreement that's proving difficult. A number of measures have already been put in place. Some prisoners have been freed. Some who were living in exile have returned to the country. But the agreement is yet to be fully implemented, especially with regard to the organization of elections after the deadline that was agreed to in the political accord. For the time being, though, we need to form a national unity government composed of both members of the opposition 
opposition and of the current administration. Now, the main difficulty comes from the fact that the opposition is struggling to agree on which candidates should be put forward to become prime minister. Well, Congolese religious leaders who are mediators in the crisis are meanwhile growing increasingly impatient over the political deadlock. Today they met with the French Foreign Minister Jean-Marc Guerreau here in Paris and called for that December accord to be respected. Have a listen. This is France's position. It's a position I've always defended and I reiterate it today. We fully support the democratic process. We fully support elections, respect for the constitution. We support talks. This is achieved through the appointment of a new prime minister. The Congolese people do not need to know whether one or three candidates are standing. The Congolese people need a prime minister now, one chosen by the opposition and appointed by the president, as required under the agreement. Next to the biggest synchronized vaccination campaign against polio ever to be implemented in Africa. Next week, more than 190,000 polio vaccinators in 13 countries across West and Central Africa will get to work to immunize more than 116 million children. Well, volunteers will deliver oral polio vaccine to every house across all cities, towns and villages. Michelle Zafron is the director of polio eradication at the World Health Organization. He spoke to me a short time ago from Geneva. Polio has been almost eradicated in Africa. In fact, the African continent had been free of polio for almost two years when in August of 2016, so August last year, four children were paralyzed by polio in Bono State, northeastern Nigeria. Uh, and this was, of course, a big setback for the African continent that thought that they were on the, on the breach of being po declared polio-free. Immediately, the governments have declared a sort of a state of emergency and have launched immunization campaigns. And what we're doing now uh, with these synchronized campaigns across Western and Central Africa is trying to finish with polio once and for all. And finally, in South Africa, the Cape Town Fashion Festival has kicked off in style. A prelude to the South Africa Fashion Festival, the event in Cape Town is the perfect opportunity for renowned stylists to size up their competition on the vibrant African fashion scene. France 24's Caroline Dumay reports. South African fashion designer Gavin Raja was the first to show his new collection on Thursday. When he's not in Paris, the renowned stylist works out of his atelier in Cape Town. And the fact that I can do beautiful couture things which are beautifully handmade here um, in an economy which is still weaker than the euro, the pound or the dollar makes me very competitive. African fashion is more and more present on the international scene thanks to this businesswoman who spent the last 10 years showcasing African talents. She thinks that South Africa is now ready for the luxury industry. You know, people want to move up the ladder and they aspire to things that, um, you know, like that satisfy the eye, you know, like uh, luxury, like uh, beautiful clothes, beautiful cars. We have this young growing population that um, really aspires to all the, you know, lovely things in life. South Africa's arts and culture minister was at the launch of the event. Uh, we need to find a way of accessing the market in Champs-Élysées, uh, in London, uh, in the US and everywhere else. Professionals too can feel the change. This Spanish designer who started working with a dressmaker in Rwanda is now expanding all over the continent. Uh, like our philosophy is always Africa first, in production, in selling, in, in inspiration. Then we decided to start opening shops in Kenya. And now we are like opening a shop here in Cape Town. It's like a good platform for out of Africa too. Cape Town Fashion Weekends on Sunday. 1,500 professionals are expected. That's all from your Eye on Africa team. Coming up next, more international headlines. Do stay tuned. Thank you.